The papers published by Bohr in 1913 described the first quantum model of the atom, but hidden between the many calculations, Bohr presented one of the most profound concepts in quantum mechanics. How a result from classical mechanics is contained within quantum physics as a particular limit. This is a follow-up video on Bohr's atomic model, so make sure to check those videos for context. When Max Planck solved the mystery of the black body radiation in 1900, he used a mathematical trick. He later spent two months searching for a physical justification of this trick and realized that the only possible way was by introducing the idea that the radiating material and the radiation exchange energy in discrete amounts given by H nu, where nu is the frequency of the radiation and H is a new fundamental constant that we call today Planck's constant. Its appearance in any equation is a flag for quantum physics. Planck hated the idea, but published it as what he called an act of desperation. You can find all the details of the actual calculation that Planck did to solve the ultraviolet catastrophe in this video. Planck did not like the concept of quantized energy, and when Einstein promoted it to represent the energy of light quanta, what today we call photons, Planck liked it even less. Planck, Einstein, Debye, and Bohr explained different anomalous observations in atomic physics by introducing arbitrary quantization rules. But one immediate reaction to these proposals of deviations from classical physics was to ask, what happens to classical physics? If the new quantum rules represent an extension beyond classical physics, how do classical results arise from the quantum formalism? This idea has profound physical and philosophical consequences for a complete theory of quantum mechanics to be developed a few years later. In 1820, Niels Bohr gave this idea the name of correspondence principle, referring to postulates about the relationship between classical and quantum physics. In the case of the black body radiation, Planck quickly confirmed that the classical energy density, called the Rayleigh Gene's law, can be obtained from his own quantum law by taking Planck's constant to be very small. In case you are not a physicist, let me introduce you to one of the most valuable tools in physics when studying the limit cases of a formula, Taylor series. In mathematics, a Taylor series is a way to represent a function as an infinite sum. The way we use it in physics is as follows. We identify a quantity that is a small, then we expand the relevant function as its Taylor series, writing only the first few terms, and then we neglect all high-order terms. Depending on the problem, we can keep the first two or three terms of the series, and the corresponding coefficients are determined using calculus. For instance, the Taylor series of the exponential function e to the x is this infinite sum. If x is a small quantity, we can simply keep the first two terms of the series, because each of the following terms in the series becomes smaller than the previous one. Let me show you how Planck used this in 1906. This is Planck's law describing the energy density for black body radiation. According to Planck, the classical limit can be recovered by simply checking the limit of h going to zero. But h is a constant, you will say. So a more physically appropriate argument is to say that the classical limit occurs when the thermal energy kT is much higher than the energy of the emitted radiation H nu. Either way, the argument of the exponential function is small. Let's expand the exponential as a Taylor series. Simplifying terms, we obtain the Rayleigh Gene's law. And this is how Planck understood that the classical energy density can be recovered from his quantum formula. I hope you see the value of learning how to inspect a physics formula by exploring its limits. If there is one thing that we should avoid pushing to the limit is data privacy. It is not a surprise to anyone that our online activity is continuously tracked, but a less known aspect is that so-called data brokers collect, aggregate, and sell our personal information including names, login credentials, home address, and location history, exposing us to annoying spam and robocalls, but also to potential identity theft scams, and even online harassment and stalking. Incogni, the sponsor of today's video, 
reaches out to data brokers on your behalf, requests your personal data removal, and deals with any objections from their side. And the whole process is fully automated. I give it a try by creating an account. I granted Incogni the right to work for me, and they did all the rest. I was astonished by the long list of brokers who had my personal data, but also delighted with Incogni's efficiency in finding all these brokers and effectively removing my data from most of them very quickly. Take back your personal data with Incogni. For viewers of this channel, Incogni has a special 60% off an annual plan. Just head to the link in the description below and use the code JK0. Thanks to Incogni for sponsoring this video. Taylor Series gave Planck the confidence that his quantum formula contains the classical law in a special limit. The same procedure can be applied to the heat capacity of solids. The quantum result was obtained by Einstein in 1807, which I proved in this video, and the classical result is known as the Dulong Petit Law. Again, the classical limit can be obtained by simply taking the thermal energy Kt to be much higher than the vibrational energy of the molecules in the solid, H nu. We can expand the two exponentials as Taylor series, simplify terms, and finally use again that the ratio between vibrational and thermal energy is much smaller than one, so it can be neglected. From here, we recover the Dulong Petit law. This is how the classical description of the heat capacity in solids can be recovered from Einstein's quantum result. But what about Bohr's atom? As we'll see, we cannot just take the limit of h going to zero, because this would lead to radiation of infinite frequency. This is a question that Bohr addressed in part one of his trilogy, and years later became known as the correspondence principle, which is one of the most important physical and philosophical principles of quantum mechanics. Bohr first calculated the classical result. He described the classical emission of radiation according to Maxwell's electromagnetic theory, in which case the frequency of the electromagnetic radiation generated by a negative charge of magnitude E orbiting a positive nucleus of charge Z times E is given by the mechanical frequency of the electron around the nucleus equal to 1 divided by the period. Using a standard formulas from circular motion, the frequency of the electron's motion is the speed divided by the perimeter of the circular orbit. In the video about Bohr's atom, we found that the speed of the electron is given by this relation, so the formula for the classical frequency becomes this. Bohr's goal now was to recover this classical relation from his quantum formula of the frequency of the emitted radiation due to electron transitions between energy levels. Explicitly writing the definition of Rydberg's constant, the full expression is this. Now comes the question, how can we find the classical radiation frequency from the quantum formula in Bohr's model. Here we explicitly see that taking h to zero fails, producing an infinite frequency. In other words, the limit must be taken carefully. Bohr realized that to correctly obtain the classical result, he should consider an atomic transition between consecutive levels of very large radius. If these are the atomic energy levels, Bohr suggests to go very far from the nucleus so that the radiation is emitted when the electron jumps from the level n plus 1 down to the level n, where n is a large number. It is the frequency of this emitted radiation that Bohr compares with the classical case. In his paper, Bohr put it slightly differently. Let's now consider the passing of the system between two successive stationary states corresponding to n and n minus 1. But the result is exactly the same. Using the relation between radius and energy level, also found in the previous video, we can write h bar in terms of the radius and n. In this way, we can eliminate h bar from the frequency formula on the left. Replacing h bar and the corresponding indices for the large energy levels, we get this messy expression, which can be simplified to this. Now we use the fact that n is much larger than 1, and once again, we invoke Taylor. In this particular case, the function 1 plus x to the power of minus 2 can be approximated as 1 minus 2x when x is small. In our case, x is 1 divided by n, which is a small value so we can go ahead and use this approximation. We obtain this relation, and after simplifying terms, we get the final expression for the frequency of radiation, which is exactly equal to the classical case. 
In this way, we confirm that the classical radiation produced by the electron orbiting the nucleus can be recovered from the quantum orbits of Bohr's model in the limit of large quantum numbers. I should mention that the correspondence principle has been reformulated many times and in different ways. Bohr himself wrote different formulations that are not necessarily consistent with one another. There are versions of the principle based on the intensity of the radiation instead of the frequency, as well as on the rules of atomic transitions. Bohr also formulated it as a relationship between radiation and motion. Bohr was quite often ambiguous and hard to understand. In 1926, the great British theorist, Paul Dirac, discovered a systematic way to construct the quantum version of classical systems. His method is related to another formulation of the correspondence principle. In 1927, Austrian theorist Paul Ehrenfest discovered another version of the correspondence principle, known as Ehrenfest theorem, that shows how expected values of quantum operators satisfy classical equations of motion. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Bohr's papers in 1913 made him a respected physicist. His atomic model explained the spectral lines of hydrogen and solved the problem of the peculiar hydrogen lines observed in stars and in the lab, but also introduced the concept of correspondence, a very important notion in quantum mechanics showing that classical physics is just a special limit of the quantum world.